Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, my musings about uh, economization in science and of science itself. I entitled this The Change of the Game, and I would like to gratefully acknowledge uh, collaboration with Franz Schulteis uh, of the University of St. Gallen and uh, Manuel Trachtenberg from uh, Jerusalem. Uh, part of this has been already published in a script of the Swiss Science and Innovation Council and can be downloaded on the either homepage. So what is it all about? Uh, this uh, little slide shows you a diagram, what I called uh, some years ago, the public life of scientific facts. And it shows how a new finding, a novelty from the lab uh, makes its way to uh, the inclusion into a general scientific system. The red triangles indicate where we meet economical drivers in this system. This is definitely uh, in the patents, this is trivial, but this is also in the political institutions, this is in the granting organizations, this is in internal reviewing, and in all the uh, conferences and publication in scientific journals. I will come to that in a minute. So uh, that is, uh, has to do with a, a phenomenon that uh, Caulfield and Condit in a 2012 paper uh, named the cumulative forces of hype. And what you see is that it is a mixture of publication pressure, commercialization, and translation pressure, so to come up uh, with startup companies, institutional press releases, media, public interest, and so on, up to the scientific bandwagon if you want to establish a new field. Let's come to the facts. So what uh, Trachtenberg uh, calls a massification of the scientific enterprise. What we see at the moment is roughly six million researchers worldwide, which is one in a thousand of the world population. This uh, seems to be not too much, but Remember, one of thousand citizens is a researcher and this does publications. So we have one million new researchers in the developing countries in the last decade. All these people produce one million, all rough numbers, one million papers per year. As you, uh, uh, your own experience will tell you, for the acceptance of one paper, you have to decline roughly or reject roughly uh, three others. So what that means is that for one million papers per year, three million papers have to be rejected. Of this, in some four million papers, we need minimum two reviews each, which means that the six million researchers have at minimum to write eight million reviews per year just to keep up the publication machine. Now consider that 50% of these papers are never cited, more than 50%. This is a very conservative number. So this adds up to roughly 50 million papers in total since the famous Baroque times when we founded all these scientific uh, communities, so for example the Royal uh, Society. Since then, science commercialization has exploded into uh, 25,000 peer-reviewed journals, which is steadily increasing, and we see at the moment, as to be measured in Webometrics, the uh, numbers from yesterday, uh, 22,100 universities that do academic education and research. So these are the numbers. Now, what are the causalities and what are the relationships to uh, the academic practice? Here again you see the increasing numbers, both in the increase of papers as in the increase of academic research, steadily increasing numbers, and here extremely increasing numbers, 16th, 17th, 18th century, up to 2009. One problem in this extreme competition of 25,000 journals, 6 million 
six million of uh, researchers and one million papers per year, and counting the papers as a reference for productivity and for the personal careers. One problem is that we see an increasing number of we would call, we would call toxic papers. What is a toxic paper? A toxic paper contains fraud, uh, honest errors, and normally should be detected by the peer review system, but very often is retracted after publication. The upper left panel shows you an interview that was done in 2009 by uh, Fanelli and uh, collaborators, where they asked scientists about their willingness to fabricate data to get a paper into a good journal. And uh, they willingly admitted, 2%, roughly 2% willingly admitted that they already had fabricated, falsified or modified data or result. And nearly one third admitted that they had questionable, what Edward this means, questionable research practices. So this is due to the publication frequency. That means the number of papers that is needed for the next academic qualification, be it a PhD, be it a habilitation, the old German-speaking system, be it to become a professor, a full professor, a assistant professor, or getting tenure at some university. That's also the pressure to be in the round of a proper publication at the real time point. For example, at the end of the PhD, or just before being awarded a prize, or just before being awarded a tenure position. Then you have to publish in a high competitive field if you, depending on different disciplines, for example, do crystal structures, then you have to come up with a paper that contains a novelty earlier than the competitors. Or if you have commercial interests, if you have your own company, if you are associated to a company, if you want to have a startup company, and so on and so on. So this all sums up to retraction processes. And this is a very recent, October 2014, very recent essay uh, or the editorial in Nature. That Nature saw in the last two years seven papers that were affected by fraud or honest error and had to be retracted, which is a huge number for this prestigious journal. Here you see a, a summary in the, of the New York Times, a little statistics from 2000 to 2009, and you see the steep increase of uh, papers that are going to be retracted. So, retraction challenges, and uh, here again, the, least, the last 13 retractions of research papers from Nature, those that happened in 2013 and so far in 2013, certainly involve cases of honest error and commendable conduct, but they also involved six cases in which there was fraud. Honest conduct means that you have a correction to your research after publication, so that you did not know before. Then at least the peer review should have detected that something might be wrong or over exaggerated or something. But for certain reasons, the peer review obviously is not so efficient in these cases. And the other problem is real fraud. And this was six cases in 2013 and 2014 uh, just in nature. There's a very nice uh, homepage uh, website that uh, goes after that. And this is called retractionwatch.com which lists all the cases, the context and the circumstances under which such restrictions uh, occur. So the, the question is now from this very short uh, example in the relationship to uh, economic behavior, does the escalation of science uh, costs uh, uh, kill the system or are we, the other way around, are we able to maintain the system if this over-exaggerates with the cost? So uh, we have to look in what is really uh, the pressure, the, 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 the uh, uh, pressure things in, the, the pressure things in, 
in the career of an academic, and this is definitely time and attention. This is a quote from uh, Georg Frank from uh, Vienna, who wrote the book on the economy of attention. And uh, he says that scientific information is measured in terms of the attention it earns. That's the today situation since some decades. Since scientists demand scientific information as means of production, the attention that the theory attracts is the measure of its value as a capital good. So here we have the relation of economy and production and writing papers. On the other hand, the attention a scientist earns for himself is capitalized into the asset called reputation. And this is the other capitalization that the personal reputation of being a famous scientist is immediately related to the output, to the production, and uh, to the attention that you get in your scientific community. So time and attention for being or becoming a, a successful uh, researcher means you have quite a bit of competition in between students for credit, for lab space, for PhD positions, for postdoc position within the group of the teachers for the disciplinarity, very often resulting in a complete, complete monodisciplinarity in teaching in the institutions to get the best students and among the nations to keep the best students and to avoid a brain drain. The similar things are true for being a successful researcher. There you have a competition among institutions that try to get the best faculty and keep the best faculty and the nations, again, to keep the best faculty and to get the best faculty. And so it has become a question of natural national interest in the meantime, because everything with time, attention, and the best science that requires a lot of time and gives a lot of attention is related to the cross-national product uh, of a nation. By the way, a hard causal relationship that I have never been able to detect in the scientific literature. So whether this is a correlation or simple an assumption or rumor, I cannot tell you. Time and attention are scarce, and this scarcity raises all kinds of rating and ranking. It's very clear that time and attention can be opt Objective, uh, can, can be made objective by the number of publications, by the hours spent, and so you have a output of numbers, and this enables you to rate and to rank also the persons and to relate the rating and ranking, because it's time and attention, quotation or citation index, to the individual reputation of the scientists. This ends up in higher wages for talents, in efficiency thinking, so we all adopt an economical habitus, in acceleration of the research, and finally into accountability. That means evaluation processes by quantification with a feedback loop make time and attention even more scarce. So the question then is, is the number of talents of real talents growing in an analogous manner as the number of peer-reviewed papers, journals, and patents. Obviously not, otherwise they were not scarce. So the question now then is, what is the competition good for? And my hypothesis is competition is only good for private goods, not for the public and common goods, and the other hypothesis is Knowledge is a public and common good, so we should avoid competition in that manner that we are going to develop at the moment. So what we see is a game change, and the question is, is the knowledge production going to be shifted into the private sector? If so, then what we observe in economization is explainable. Then, it means fighting for talents among institution nations is moving the food, which means brains 
follow the money. Question of infrastructure and the richness. Fighting for credits is that the students grab for low-hanging fruits, minimization of the efforts, highest efficiency for getting the highest number of credits in the shortest times. Credit-driven instead of interest-driven. Fighting for impact means publish as much as possible with highly renowned people in a field with high attention, again, impact-driven instead of interest-driven, and fighting for time could mean don't reflect but produce and be efficient. This leads again in the second uh, perspective to strange sponsoring effects in, within academic institutions. The most favored one, which all the granting institutions that I met around the world, is the so-called Matthew effect. Matthew 25, 29, for unto everyone that has shall be given, and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken even that which he hath. Which means granting organization or funding always prefer the successful researchers. And the question is, what are the successful researchers? The successful researchers are those with the highest reputation and the highest attention, which means in the logic that we have developed the highest citation index or the highest number of papers. This is then why the equality of disciplines is lost. So if you compare neuroscience with theoretical physics or with astronomy or this uh, Catholic uh, philosophy, then you will find a fundamental difference in the equality. This again has the threat of a potential withdrawal of the state. It may provoke an increased flat, ra uh, flat rate taxation and lead to reduced budget for education because of this efficiency striving and related to the following utilitarianism that is related to this efficiency striving and the, um, the, the, the lost equality. So another threat is that additional money coming often reduces the scope for development. So instead of broadening your perspective here, if you are successful, if you get more money for the same type of research you do, then you simply lose the interest for the neighboring fields and for interdisciplinarity. So the question then is, how innovative can you be? Historically, it was quite the opposite. In the foundation uh, papers of the uh, uh, first European University in uh, Bologna, it was made clear that it was a clearance, independence from Papst, Pope and Emperor, from Papst and Kaiser. So you had to be independent from state support and from ideology and religion. And this was the most important success factor, the most important asset of this first university in 12th century. The other phase of the medal is the danger that you use economical behavior to get reputation not by research, but just by knowing how the game works. And this is done in these two uh, examples, both uh, taken from science in 2011, where universities simply buy ranking places. So that you can jump from somewhere in the, in the 10,000s uh, within one year or two year to the 200 to 300 bracket in the Shanghai ranking. And this is done again by traditional economical and um, uh, uh, accounting technologies. If you use an accounting program 
for measuring the efficiency of your scientists. Then you can ask the scientist with the highest reputation uh, to spend the time at the other university and you pay him, uh, let's say, a honorary of, uh, of 100,000, uh, roughly $100,000 or $70,000 per year and some business class flight and uh, the uh, other part of the contract is that this scientist is then um, giving his, the second address of your university in all his publications. And that makes you simply jump from somewhere in the nowhere to a serious position in between 300 and 400 in these cases. So this is not only the case with the two universities quoted here, but this has been uh, in effectious, an infectious uh, disease uh, all around the world uh, at the moment. The problem of moving the food means that you have a shift in the valuing of the disciplines. Moving the food means that scientists behave like cats. Cats cannot be educated. But to convince a cat to do something means you simply move the food, and then the cat will follow the food. And that is how the ironic perspective on the behavior of scientists is of today. I have already talked about this Scopus mentality of accounting uh, uh, measures for science, and these are the effects. If you move the food, you will go into an entrepreneur mentality, which means high productivity and efficiency, and you will be market driven. This will end up in a flattening of your language with a high jargon efficiency, and that is what we already see today. Even within one discipline, people cannot talk anymore to each other in inorganic chemistry or in organic chemistry or in mathematics and uh, psychiatry. And this also ends up in a highly, extremely uh, uh, fixated and um, formalized uh, type of publication. And this has already been known since uh, last century, the 80s in the last century, where uh, Matziger and Merkwood uh, published a paper uh, to protest against uh, the passive voice, the style of uh, 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 publishing that uh, started to become fashionable because of this uh, efficiency uh, and productivity uh, driven markets. And uh, the funny thing is Pauli Matzinger is a very, very famous um, uh, scientist in uh, immunology and uh, Merkwood is her Afghan dog. And nobody, nobody realized uh, uh, that in the paper these two authors a uh, little bit protested against the passive voice. It was a, a very hard science paper. Okay, so these things here are contra uh, to the interdisciplinarity, to the development of a dis interdisciplinary setting because too much time is needed to avoid jargon efficiency. You have to talk too much, you have to explain too much. So this jargon efficiency is created by this market-driven or productivity and efficiency means and uh, is contraintuitive uh, to interdisciplinarity and it leads to highly incremental proposals. So we have less innovation because all in the same mental state of a certain jargon, you will only have incremental ideas for uh, proceeding with your research together with the Matthäus effect that I showed you before. My hypothesis is that we are going to lack innovation and we see this already. So the conclusion is we have uh, exogenic forces which is an academic and economic tsunami with much more than one 
to 1.5 million papers coming in the next year, which is still a steeply increasing number of uh, journals. So that will lead to a complete budget conscious leading of academic institution with an with a all or nothing game. So we will be run by numbers, very simply. And I think that we have to counteract with endogenic forces, we should strive for objectivity with a strict self-reflection, really ask ourselves permanently, why are we doing this experiment? What is the contribution of this experiment to the general knowledge? And uh, is it justified to use uh, money for that? Shouldn't I do uh, something else? In the publication for the scientific community, should the, the publication should be used as a quality measure, not as a quantity measure, a quality measure and a self-correction, and we should adhere definitely to a long-term discrete and critical thinking and not to a short-term thinking that is output oriented, uh, oriented instead of outcome oriented. So far my ideas on the relationship of economy and science and the future of the economization of science. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.